The players of the European International Championships 2022 were all presented with a seemingly straightforward problem. However, it was a problem that if solved, could win them $10,000. No one said it was an easy problem though. But with over 600 masters in attendance from all over the world, all focusing on this one problem, someone had to solve it, right? This is the story of the European International Championships 2022. Seventy percent of the meta in the run-up to the event was split between two powerful archetypes. Mu V Max was still the boogeyman of the format, widely regarded as the strongest deck. It definitely had the biggest of targets on its back. Mu V Max's cross fusion strike for two energy copies the attack of any of your fusion strike Pokémon in play, and you definitely have some powerful attacks at hand. Genesect V's Techno Blast is the bread and butter attack, providing a clean 210 damage. However, Genesect V didn't just provide the attack, it also provided the draw engine via its Fusion Strike system ability, which allows you to draw up to the amount of Fusion Strike Pokemon you have in play. And this stacks, allowing you to draw up to 24 cards a turn. Absolutely crazy. Meloetta also provides a deadly one prize attacking option via Melodorous Echo, which does 70 damage for each one of your Fusion Strike energy in play. This seems average, however, when paired with Elisa's Sparkle, you can accelerate up to three Fusion Strike energies in a turn, allowing for a deadly 210 plus damage turn one onslaught going second. Not to mention, if you have all four in play, Mew can now swing for upwards of 300 damage. With the help of power tablets for damage buffing, double turbo energy for one turn attacking pressure, and Oracorio in combination with Psychic Leap to help prize deny and reduce damage, Mew VMAX was poised to do really well in Frankfurt with one regional win already and nine top eights in the 2022 season. It was quite clear for the players in attendance, either play Mew, or play to beat Mew. Luckily, Brilliant Stars printed a card that could stand up to Mew, with a few different partners no less. If Mew is the glamorous front runner of the format, Drawing a ton of cards and doing 210 damage turn 1, Arceus V-Star is the heavy-handed grinding deck of the format. You know, the Risharam to Zekrom, the beautiful White Tree Hollow to the Metropolis Black City. You know, you get the point. Arceus' Trinity Nova does 200 damage and accelerates 3 basic energy to your V-Pokemon in any way you like. But in combination with its killer V-Star power Starbirth, you can piece together some otherwise impossible game plans. But what does Starbirth do? Allows you to search any two cards from your deck. Any two cards at any time. That's crazy. Considering past cards that came close to this were either reserved for stage twos or once per deck A specs, don't get it twisted. This V-Star power is crazy, allowing for an absolute myriad of different attackers to be partnered. Beedrill was gaining some traction, first seen in Salt Lake City. Starbirth allowed for an easy Mustard play. Mustard can only be played if it's the last card in your hand. But then it would allow you to grab any single strike Pokemon from your deck, put it straight into the play and then draw 5 cards. And while this seems troublesome, trust me it's worth it since Beedrill for 1 energy KOs your opponent if they have any special energy attached. Crazy stuff, and like I mentioned earlier, 70% of the format was either Mew or Arceus, meaning this one prizer for one energy okos all those attackers. Ouch. Lycanroc was a strange variant that offered a very basic, unique selling point, however, it was really effective as well, being a fighting type that was not weak to Psychic. This meant you can hit other Arceus decks for weakness and actually use it against Mew as well. Although its match edge attack is pretty average without weakness, its Hunting Claw offered a really unique game style, allowing you to KO a Pokemon with under 60 HP, such as Sobble. Speaking of Sobble, Arceus Inteleon was easily the front runner of the Arceus deck, 
with it already winning the Sao Paulo Regional Championship recently. This variant trades out other attackers in favour for a thick Intellion line to pluck out tech cards such as Cheren's Care for damage removal, Dunsparce to remove weakness and Melanie for less reliance on finding energy turn 1. And with a game plan that revolves around using Path to the Peak to slow down Genesec V's and other Arceus in combination with Marnie to limit your opponent's hand size, Arceus and Teleon seem to be the best Arceus deck coming into the event. Arceus Babao played similar to Arceus and Teleon, except it could want a Crobat VMAX to help against Mew VMAX and an increased Path to the Peak count. Path to the Peak. Hmm. Good card, isn't it? So back to our $10,000 question, how to beat both of these archetypes? Ability Lock seems to be a crack in the armour of both Mudex and Arceus, since they are both reliant on Genesect and Starbirth respectively. 310 damage seems to be the magic number because that Oko's Arceus and Mew VMAX as well, and Mew VMAX is weak to Dark and Arceus is weak to Fighting. And both decks have a real big reliance on Special Energy. So with that information, I'm going to ask you again. So with that information, can you solve this problem? Don't worry, I couldn't either. But we had over 600 players from all over the world, such as America, UK, Germany, France, Spain, Brazil, Australia, and Norway, all attempting to. And someone's got to, right? After 14 rounds, we had one of the most stacked top eights I've ever seen, including Justin Bakari, Isaiah Bradner, Kai Nugan, Ford the Lord Reclef, Matusk Ruzanet, Pedro Torres, Frank Persic, and Gustavo Wada. Pedro Torres, one time OCIC champion, was going into top eight undefeated, going 9 0 5. Let's see what he was playing. Hello everyone, I'm Pedro E. Torres uh, from Spain. I was uh, considering for this tournament Ursifu VMAX and Arceus. I went to a bootcamp and we were testing like Mew, Malamar, Ursifu, Arceus. After our testing, Arceus didn't feel that great. Um, so then I was testing Ursifu VMAX also with my friends against every kind of deck. And uh, Ursifu VMAX felt uh, pretty good in my testing. We play a small Ursifu line, a 2 2 Ursifu VMAX line. A lot of decks you hit them for weakness. Right now, the fighting weakness is super, super popular. Um, you can get thrust for one energy you kind of want to kill almost uh, all the format if you hit for weakness uh, Ushifu VMAX probably one of the best uh, fighting attackers in the game if not the best thanks to uh, GMAX Rapid Flow you can 122 Pokemon uh, and take the last prizes sometimes Galarian Moltres V special, uh, sorry Galarian Moltres is pretty good especially against Mew VMAX and it's actually a really good attacker late game against every deck because you can actually hit for a lot of damage during the game uh, when the opponent took some prizes but yeah it's a really crucial and really key card against Mew VMAX um, because when the opponent take the prize number three uh, in advance you actually take three prizes thanks to this card. So Pedro opted for the combination of Rapid Strike Urshifu to pressure Arceus and Galeria Moltres to pressure Mew VMAX and honestly this seems like a crazy combination on paper. Remember this combination. We're going to see it again. Gustavo Wada, defending EUIC champion, was playing Urshifu Moltres as well. However, he added a few different cards to Pedro, such as a Moltres V to act as a reliable 190 damage machine, an extra Avery, and an energy retrieval. For which at face value doesn't seem too important, but we will see it later for sure. He played against Justin Bakari in top 8. Justin, Isaiah Bradner, Rahul Reddy and Michael Slutsky all played this deck for the event. And worth noting, they all scored points as well. They settled on Urshifu Moltres as well. But in order to help show up the Arceus matchup, if they played Manaphy and Dunsparce as well, they added a Medicham. This then let them concentrate on the Mew matchup, which by their own admission is worthy of a video on its own. But to help eliminate their main concern, early game dead drawing, they added Celebrations Mew. These additions didn't help against Gustavo Wada, however, as he won and advanced to top 4. Matusk was piloting Mew VMAX, but his list was designed to help against Path to the Peak which was the most obvious on-the-face way of countering Mew. He played a Punkaboo, 
this was essentially a ball searchable stadium as when you put it in play you can discard a stadium that's in play allowing you to draw cards via fusion strike system once again in combination with scoop up net that means he could reuse it or even bench another fusion strike pokemon allowing him to get six of fusion strike system respectively he matched high in top eight who was playing a sylveon box deck this deck utilized arceus v stuff for consistency sylveon v max for psychic weakness urshifu for fighting weakness and crobat v max for dark weakness hoping to hit anything in format for weakness However, Mew Tempo was too much for Ty to handle in game one. And Ty just says, even though I'm making this attack, you have the Mew VMAX on the bench to just return the KO. I'm going to scoop it up. We'll head to game number two. Mateus wins game one of top. And in game two, he unfortunately prized his Crobat VMAX. However, he did have the chance to find it via Peonia, but unfortunately he missed. Potential. You have Peonia as well. So we're actually going to see the Peonia get played. So we'll yeah, go ahead and grab some prizes. prizes. Uh, this is a pretty risky play, though. It's banking off of finding something, but... Oh, no, it doesn't draw to the Arceus V-Star. It was the right most prize through the left one. Allowing for Mew to get way too far ahead, seeing Matusk in top four. Here start the Fusion Strike systems. Draws into two oh, yeah. Matics. Two Matics in hand. There's the heads. heads on the first one. Mateus grabs the boss's orders, can bring up the Sylveon. Is there a damage modifier another way? Oh, he's just attacking. That's 190 damage, that's not enough. Doesn't Sylveon have 200 hit points? The last top eight game saw Tord the Lord versus Frank Persic. And Tord was also undefeated at this point. He was playing Urshifu Moltres as well, but disaster for him, he ran into a surprise rogue deck. Although it wouldn't have been too much of a surprise if you watched my channel Fireball videos which seems to be the perfect meta call for the day. Frank was playing Whimsicott V-Star, a deck that aims to target both Mew and Arceus in two different ways. The first way was three copies of Path to the Peak, but we all know about that, that's boring. How else does Whimsicott destroy both Mew and Arceus? With its attack, Quick Wind. This attack does 160 damage and prevents your opponent from playing special energy cards and tool cards from their hand. This is huge denying double turbo energy from Arceus V-Star and effectively denying all energy from Mew VMAX, this puts a thorn in both their sides. Don't get it twisted, both decks do have outs however via Melanie, Raihan and Elisa Sparkle, but Frank was ready for this and he played 4 copies of Crushing Hammer and Fan of Waves as well to remove those energies and push back tempo back into Whimsicott's favour and make life super hard for Mew and Arceus players alike. Bluffball Star is also equally bonkers which does 60 damage for each energy attached to this Pokemon to any Pokemon in play allowing for some massive power spike turns. With EXP share keeping energy in play, allowing Whimsicott to chain attackers if needed, this was a killer choice for EUIC, and it saw Frank win his top 8 match going into top 4, being Tord's only loss of the event. There he matched Pedro Torres. Luckily for Frank, Pedro didn't draw particularly well after Frank's turn 2 trick wind. And he's going to initiate that prize race and knock out Snorlax cleanly here with the trick wind. That means Pedro is no longer able to attach special energy this turn. We also saw Fluff Ball Star take a huge KO. And is your V-Star power. It can actually hit any Pokemon on the field. It does not have to be the active. So that's always kind of an advantage. But... You know, it is any energy, and we do see they're getting the KO yeah, doubling yeah. up. Which put Frank very far ahead. However, Moltres was able to swing back tempo, but Pedro was one card off being able to reuse it again. I, he hasn't, he doesn't really have any way to attack, and it may just be game over. The money may have just been too dangerous. And Frank's Bibarel came in the clutch, finding boss for game. True. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong, but there it, it is. With the boss's the orders. second Industrious Incisors gets Frank the boss's orders required to go up one game in this series. A really intriguing back and forth there. 
In game two, Pedro was visibly upset with his start. It was the best thing that happened in that game. shaking his head. He's not happy with his start. He's a very emotional player. Uh, he's also a streamer and he certainly is great at showing his emotions. But he's also letting us know that he is not happy with his start. He's also prized his one copy of Sword and Shield Inteleon, which is a crucial piece as well. So uh, if his hand's not good, neither is uh, his prize cards. And with him prizing his one copy of Sword and Shield Inteleon, definitely set him back. Pedro then attempted to stabilize with a Snorlax Gormandize. Scoop up net and Medicham, that really does feel bad. The Peonia has hurt him very, like a lot. As we are gonna see more quick shooting set up here. And it's just gonna be a Gormandize for a fresh hand by the looks of things, cause what he's got right now ain't much to work with. No, there was a route though to use quick shooting, scoop up net, evolve a bench drizzle into it, and then you can quick shooting again. But that would have involved having a lot more resources. Oh yeah. Unfortunately he does not have. But Frank played a clutch Marnie to deny any room for a comeback for Pedro. He's also been able to, uh, well, Frank's been able to Marnie away the big Gormandizer and make oh. life even more awkward for Pedro. However, Pedro went out in an absolute blaze of glory, using Call for Family to get out a Medicham V, allowing Frank to end the game one turn soon. That's about all he can do. We are going to see the binding energy attachment for the call for family. Pedro going out in style. And hey, he's at least enjoying his Pokemon today. He is. And let's face it, right? Top four of an international championship is Getting pretty gosh darn good. He's just saying Frank let it end. <laughs> <laughs> so we do see Fog Crystal 4 and energy going on there. We're using the V-Star power to is. get a KO on the Metacham. And Frank is going to be in the finals of the European International championships with Whimsicott. And that saw Frank, the rogue deck building god, into the final. The other top four game was Gustavo Wada versus Matuk Ruzanek. And game one was a super close affair after Wada had a couple turns too many of dead drawing, allowing Matus to have boss for game. He's holding a ton of options with Shady Dealings next turn, and he can have that big Fiery Wrath KO for three prizes, but I believe it's all wrapped up here. Absolutely, if Mateus has, and there we go, boss's orders, Muvi Max, and an energy, and Mateus takes a pretty quick 1-0 victory. Well, Game two proved dicey for Gustavo as well. However, a cheeky KO on a Muvi. And there's a second Sobble, this. this is different. This is the difference between hitting it and missing it right here. This is our sliding doors moment, Joe. Oh my goodness, absolutely incredible. And the surprise Moltres V coming out of nowhere via Raihan definitely helped swing game two back in Gustavo's favor. As he's gonna take that three prize knockout with Aura Burn, the Dire Flame Wings and Raihan combining to get this two prize Pokemon out of nowhere to score a big three prize response KO here. And without any hand disruption, Matus scooped up game two, looking to try and go ahead in game three. He had everything established, yeah. yeah. Now we got free energy, we got Galarian Moltres, we've got the pivot, and there we go, Gustavo Wada takes game two. Game three saw baby Moltres swinging multiple times, really keeping on the pressure. And after a missed KO, this saw another Gustavo Wada checkmate scenario with two baby Moltres in play, ready to go. As was nice. So, and yeah, there we go. That's oh the game. Goodness. It's just a concession. Gutierrez is incredible. Gustavo is headed to the final. But this is the final before, I guess. Gustavo um, usually have a map there too. And this saw Gustavo in the final, ready to defend his EUIC crown. Right, but before we get into the final, I have to give a huge shout out to this video sponsor, Pokédex. Where else in Europe can you get an exact 60 that you request delivered to you as early as the next working day? With sleeves and with dice. There's not many places, so I suggest if you need a deck for any of these up and coming regionals, go check out Pokédex. But let's get to the final, baby! Jeez! As they were both shuffling up, both looking at a friend across the table, they were ready to play one of the biggest matches of Pokemon in their life. One single best of three that would win them $10,000. Now, I was sat there in the crowd watching both players shuffle up, and I honestly had no clue who was going to win. On one hand, Gustavo is the reigning EUIC champion, looking to defend his championship. But on the other hand, Frank has already 2-0'd this archetype when it was piloted by Tord. 
and beat Pedro as well, no less. Proving that Whimsicott was a killer medical for the day. So honestly, it could go either way. One thing we definitely didn't expect to see, however, was Bibarel attacking turn two. That's for sure. In here, I haven't seen a Tail Smash on stream before, so this nope. could be a first for me. Yeah! 100 damage with What a crazy out. attacker. This is not <laughs> Frank's main attacker. <laughs> but there you go, 100 damage, and the crowd are loving to see this. And unfortunately for Frank, that very slow start caught up with him, and game one was always just out of reach, leading to a quick 6 0 victory for Gustavo. No, and if with no attack, Gustavo is just going to be able to attack. Like you say, it's going to be a two hit KO, not a one hit KO, but Frank needs to take six prizes at this stage, and trying to do that before you've been KO'd by Gustavo. It's it's pretty much impossible at this stage. You've got the Galarian Moltres V. There is a Rapid Strike Urshifu V Max on the bench, which can come in and do 150 damage. There's a possibility of playing the Galarian Moltres a single prizer. So at this stage, it's looking like too tough a road for Frank. Uh, and, it, and I think he agrees. <laughs> I think it's going to be a concession. Um, that's going to be our first game. We were all watching live at the event, only a couple meters away from the stage thinking, surely Frank can't dead draw so bad again, right? In game two, however, he led Crobat and it got stuck in the active, allowing Wada to set up a Moltres V and even use double spin on Sobble. Be awesome. And we're actually going to be seeing a double spin from the Sobble and uh, it's going to be just the 20 damage, I believe. <laughs> but then a clutch Marnie came out of nowhere. <laughs> One head split there. Uh, it's not completely irrelevant, um, but it's not great. And oh, oh huge from Frank! That's picks a up top the money. He's back in the game. Literally rubbed his hands <laughs> as he did that, giving it the let's go. He's happy to see it, no doubt. And he's going to get himself five fresh cards here. Leading to a very interesting scenario. Leaving Wada with the choice. Does he use this Moltres V again to attack? Sure, it takes prizes, but then it actually KOs itself. Or does he try and use a different attacker and try and save this Moltres V? Hello, <laughs> Venomous <laughs> Fang. <laughs> we are going to see the double KO. It's a rare sight. The Aura Burn damages um, Gustavo's own Galarian Moltres V. Wada opted to take the prizes. Sure, this seems odd on paper, but this makes baby Moltres even stronger. And unfortunately, because Frank missed EXP share, all he can do is Fluffball star with Sobble. Yeah, because uh, Gustavo would have had to have it attached. Is. And we are going to see the Fluffball star for Tempo from Frank. And I actually really like this choice. Um, it denies a lot of outs from Gustavo. However, the lack of offensive Tempo from Frank allowed Gustavo to have an absolute myriad of different options to attack with including Crobat V, the Moltres V, and Baby Moltres as well. Well, from that energy search earlier on in the turn, we're going to see the retreat of the Darkness energy. Crobat has sponged some nice damage there, and uh, we will see the two-hit KO via the Fiery Wrath, and Gustavo filling his board even more so with Sobble can safely do this now that he's seen two Avery hit the discard pile. And Gustavo's going to put himself two prize cards away and still has a lot of options in hand. Uh, but the good news is it's going to be a KO, and it does mean that the experience share is going to be live, so Frank can actually chain his attackers here. We'll pull that with Frank's hand being completely clogged with unplayables, and Gustavo Wada had boss for game, utilizing, again, that clutch energy retrieval. It wasn't enough. Now, we could see, is there a choice bout available here? No, but there the is game. a Crobat, and Gustavo Wada is your European international champion. Uses that boss's orders, takes out that Crobat, gets the KO, and takes a fairly straightforward 2-0 victory. Frank, a phenomenal achievement coming all the way up to second, but Gustavo's going to want it two years in a row. Wow, what an absolutely insane achievement, and that little 20 damage from a Sobble attack, of all things, <laughs> set up that Crobat for a KO with the Fiery Wrath from the Galarian Moltres, a key piece in Gustavo's deck. Crowning Gustavo Wada, the defending 2022 EUIC champion and the person who solved a $10,000 Pokemon TCG problem.